Think about this for a second. I have never once opened up my chest and seen my own heart. And yet, I am pretty sure that I do have one. Now, how can I possibly know this? Wouldn't this assertion be a leap of faith? No, because I have a tremendous amount of evidence that shows me that my heart is real. I can feel it with my hands. I can hear it with a stethoscope. I can hook up an EKG and see its electrical activity. Not one of these things is a direct observation, but they all provide me with evidence, not faith, that my heart is really there. Now, is it possible that this is actually a tiny little steam engine powered by pixies? Sure, but I don't have any evidence for that, so why would I believe it? So when you say that it requires faith to believe in evolution, you're missing the fact that we have a tremendous amount of evidence showing us that evolution is real. And even if we never get the chance to directly observe it, which we actually can do sometimes, there's still more than enough reason to accept the theory of evolution, no faith required. Are you shitting my dick? Look, I can break down how hibernation works for you a little bit, but I can promise you, it's not going to make you feel any better. Because you're right. Hibernation isn't just sleeping, it's actually several consecutive bouts of what we call torpor. And torpor is when an animal's metabolic processes just completely plummet to almost nothing. We're talking about a couple of heartbeats a minute. We're talking about a couple of breaths every 10 to 20 minutes. We're talking about a body temperature that is so low that it would easily kill almost any other animal. And they stay that way for a few days to a few weeks before coming out of torpor and resuming normal metabolic function for like maybe 24 hours and then going right back into it again, over and over and over again throughout the course of their hibernation cycle. That's what it actually is. And there are animals like, for example, the black bear, which don't poop or pee for the entire time, but they can have kids and lactate and nurse their young all while hibernating. So, like, you go to sleep one night, and then you wake up six months later with toddlers. It's like a Stephen King nightmare. I just, the thing is, we don't know how hibernation actually works. We know that it's genetically controlled, but we also know that literally all mammals have the genes to be able to do this, to be able to control their metabolism in this extreme way. It's just only some of them that actually do. So, like I said, man, I, I can give you so much information on it, but it's just going to raise more questions for you. I don't care who it is. Kiss the person next to you. <laughs> if your cousin Cletus calls you and tells you that he has a theory about how frogs are controlling the weather, it's okay to just assume that the word theory means wild guess. But in science, we use the word theory completely differently. A theory is the highest level to which we can possibly elevate an idea. It's a functional explanation for observed natural phenomena that's backed by all the best evidence that we have. And no, theories don't become laws when they're proven. Laws and theories are completely different things. Take, for example, the law versus the theory of gravity. The law of gravity, that f sub g is equal to g times m1 m2 divided by r squared, is something that you can plug any numbers into and come up with a mathematical answer. Whereas the theory of gravity, that massive objects warp space-time and pull other massive objects toward their center, is something that's still being studied by scientists today. The law tells you what's happening, the theory tells you how. So anytime anybody tells you that they don't believe in something in science because it's all just theories, remind them of the theories of gravity, cells, germs, plate tectonics, and evolution. They are all true. So I'm working on a project right now, and I had to sign some contracts and send those contracts off. And for some reason, my scanner is just being really weird. It's been on the fritz all week. So I had to scan everything with my phone. So when I sent these contracts off, I wanted to put in the email that, hey, I scanned these with my phone. Let me know if this is cool. And I typed in, my scanner is being. And the next predicted word was touched. So I'm like, what's up with that? So I just started hitting the next word on the predictive text over and over and over to see what my phone would expect me to say. What is the thing that I say so often that's just, that's what my technology expects of me now. And this is what it came up with. My scanner is being touched by other atoms and the sharing occurs between all of their valence orbitals until they reach an octet and they are the reason we exist. And the next sentence it expects starts with zombie? Like, what is my life, dude? So let's say you were to stop smoking right now, which I encourage you to do. After the first 20 minutes without a cigarette, your heart rate and your blood pressure begin to return to normal. After about one day without a cigarette, your body is almost completely nicotine-free, 
carbon monoxide levels in your blood begin to return to normal as well. Also, your blood vessels are dilating all throughout your body, so you're getting more oxygen to literally all of your tissues. Within one week of stopping smoking, you're going to notice that your senses of taste and smell are beginning to return to normal as well. Also, studies show that people who are able to make it one whole week without smoking are nine times more likely to be successful in stopping smoking. How awesome is that? Within about one to three months of quitting, you're going to notice that you're coughing and hacking and wheezing less and less and less. This is because the columnar cells that line your airways, whose whole job it is to push mucus and tar and ash and soot and debris up out of your lungs, which you have been destroying with smoke this whole time, are finally starting to regrow. So you're having more productive coughs, getting all that phlegm and nastiness up out of your lungs. And by about three to nine months, your total lung function has improved about 10%. So you're going to have an easier time getting around, you're getting more oxygen throughout your blood, you're not having so much trouble getting up the stairs anymore. Also, people at this stage report having just lower stress levels overall, and they're able to get through stressful situations without craving a cigarette all the time. How nice is that? After one year of not smoking, your risk of heart attack is half that of a smoker. After 10 years without smoking, your risk of lung cancer is half that of a smoker. And after 15 years without a single cigarette, your risk of all of these smoking-related illnesses is about the same as someone who's never smoked before. Now, that can sound really scary and daunting, right? 15 whole years, oh my goodness. But remember, that's 15 years since your last cigarette. So that can be 15 years from right now, or it can be 15 years from tomorrow, or it can be 15 years from next month. Or it can be 15 years from next year, so now 16 years. The point is, the sooner that you start stopping, the faster you're going to be through this. And this is a journey that gets easier and easier the longer you're on it. So for anybody watching this who is still smoking cigarettes, please put down that nasty cancer stick. It is gross. It is expensive. It is a dumb way to die. I would say good luck, but we both know you don't need it. You've got this. Let's say you want to make a protein. How are you going to do it? Well, think back to middle school bio. You're going to take your DNA and transcribe it into RNA, and then that RNA sticks into a ribosome, which translates it into a protein, right? But think about that just a little bit deeper. What kind of RNA are we talking about? Well, it's messenger RNA, mRNA, and that sticks into a ribosome. What are ribosomes made of? They're made of ribosomal RNA, rRNA. And then what brings over the amino acids to build the protein? Well, it's transfer RNA tRNA. So you're making RNA to stick into RNA so that RNA can help you build a protein. Not only is this one of my favorite evidences for the RNA world hypothesis, the idea that RNA evolved before DNA because it can be used as both genetic material and also as a catalyst, but it's also one of my favorite cell biofacts in the whole world, and now you know it too. Guess if you add baking soda to your cocktails, you won't be able to taste the alcohol. Happy Monday. Uh, you guys asked for this, not me. So apparently you can't taste it with the baking soda. He did vodka. I'm going to do tequila, naturally. Several people have tagged me in this video asking for help. What you just did was make club soda. You mix sparkling water with baking soda and salt. That's club soda. And that's why club soda is such a popular mixer for all sorts of drinks, because it takes the sting out of the alcohol. If you added some quinine, it would taste bitter, and that would be tonic water. And then you could make something like a gin and tonic from scratch. So please drink and do chemistry responsibly. Good day. I'm a biologist. I study humans. It's five in the morning, and my brain won't let me sleep. One of the defining characteristics of the genus Homo is our ability to make stone tools. It's something we've been doing for over two and a half million years, going all the way back to our early, early ancestors, Homo habilis, who were the first ones to make these big stone choppers that allowed them to break open bones and scoop out the bone marrow. The access to that new resource fueled the development of bigger and bigger brains, until eventually our brains got so much bigger that we were able to develop even better stone tools and use those stone tools to get access to even better resources, which then further fueled brain development until we got to where we are today. All of this is a part of something called niche construction theory, the way that an organism can change its environment and then adapt to that new changed environment, creating a sort of evolution and behavior feedback loop that just goes on and on and on, creating some of the weirdest animals to ever walk the planet. And when you think about that, you'll start to realize that as much as we made stone tools, those tools made us in return. 
And that gets you thinking about the concept of the extended phenotype. You see, a beaver's dam is something that they are instinctually compelled to build. The dam is a part of the beaver's DNA. It's something that they have to do. And everything that occurs because of that dam, all the changes that go on downstream, the whole ecosystem changing, that is a part of the beaver's DNA as well. It's an extension of what it means to be a beaver. There is significant evidence that, at least in some species of humans, like Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis, at least some tool making was genetically controlled. Which means that the tools we make everything from simple hammers and nails to the cell phone that I'm talking to you on at this moment, are physical representations of what it means to be a human, extensions of our very DNA. And just like with the beaver dam and everything downstream changing, the tools we make change the very face of the planet. We build whole civilizations. Those are physical extensions of what it means to be a human as well. When you consider this for a moment, you'll come to two conclusions. Number one, hopefully the same conclusion I've come to, is that humans are one of the coolest animals around. So much fun to think about. And number two, that if this is all just a part of being human, then we can decide what that means. We can choose whether we want to leave this up to random chance and allow climate change to seal our fates, or if we want to make a difference and make the world the way that it should be for us. Do the right thing. Take care of the planet. It's the human thing to do.